This, okay, kids, they, all the kids want to know the answer. They think it's a trick question. On number one, on the, on the questions there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this from, the, from God's Word, and then you tell me what you think the answer is. All right, y'all pay attention. Verse 12. Nobody has seen and continues to see God at any time. Does that answer your question? All right, what's the first part of nobody? No. <laughs> no, you can't see God. It's pretty plain. So it says nobody has seen and continues to see. In other words, it, it, no one has seen in the past and they're not going to be able to see in the future. God at any time. Now, if we might be loving one another, God is residing in us and His love in us, it is being perfected or continues to be perfected. Understand, for the word perfect here in the original language is not talking about being flawless. I think that's a, it's a standard as humans that it's not going to happen. But it's talking about being completed or matured. So when you look at that, you say, God is residing in us and His love in us is being matured or completed, fulfilled, and it continues to be perfected, completed, or matured. But I want to start talking about that first phrase. Y'all know what First John's been about. It's been about getting closer to God. It's about through His commandment, by obeying His commandments, by obviously loving one another. We spent the entire third and fourth chapters basically talking about loving one another. And that's how we can know that we are His. And that's how others can know that we're His. But then in verse 12, out of the blue, he says something random. Nobody has seen God at any time. And you scratch your head and you think, what does this have to do with anything that he's been talking about? Well, let's just play this long. I will give you a hint. You won't know completely until next Sunday. <laughs> You'll, you'll understand next Sunday why he threw this in here. But for the moment, we're going to talk about no one seeing God. In speaking of the Father, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.17 that now the King eternal, immortal, invisible. In other words, he's invisible. You can't see him. That uh, meaning uh, that Jesus declared of God the Father that God is a spirit. And in John 4, 24, meaning that God the Father has no tangible body which may be seen. Now we picture God up on the throne, don't we? When we see this picture, He's sitting on a throne and Jesus is at His right hand side, you know. And so we, we get this mental, I don't know what picture you have. But I can tell you that whatever, you know, I, I'll tell you what picture I have. He, God either looks at one or two people. One is a, a kind of a, 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 a hefty set, jolly guy with a smile on his face, a long, flowing white, white hair, and a, and a big old beard. And that's what you, oh, oh say, that's Santa Claus. Uh, or actually, the one I always think about when I think of, of God is George Burns. Y'all ready? Okay, some of you older folks remember that. <laughs> he played God. And, uh, you know, God, we don't know what he looks like. We can't know what he looks like because no one's ever seen him. Now, we picture him sitting on the throne, and we don't know what he looks like, but we know that the Spirit, Holy Spirit, has manifested itself in the form of dove and fire, etc. So it does manifest, and we know the Son has manifested himself in body. He walked 
walked around with people in flesh, so we know. We might not know exactly what he looks like because we weren't there. There were no photographs, but that he could be seen. Matter of fact, in 1 John 1 and 2, John saying that they handled him, they touched him. He was real. So, knowing that, the, that God the Father is invisible should make us more humble. Now, how do you figure that? How God being invisible should make us more humble in our relationship to Him? Well, number one, if you think you've got God figured out, you're not being very humble. I, I can assure you of that. Um, He's com not completely knowable by us. We're not going to be able to know God. We can't completely figure out God. We don't know His secrets. He is, His thoughts are higher than ours. We, we can't even comprehend some of the most basic things of God. We only know what God has allowed us to know through His Word. He's beyond us. God is God. And we are not. <laughs> and sometimes I think we put ourselves in the place of God and try to understand things from our perspective as God. In other words, we say, well, if I was God, this is the way I would do it. Well, thank goodness we are not God. Right? But He is God and we can't know Him. We can't see Him. And that's the, that's the thing. There are a lot of folks today who treat him differently. Alright, this is going to be an embarrassing question, and, I, and please answer honestly. How many of you were you growing up, and, not, and if, you're, if you see him, still see him as an adult, I don't want to know. But as you were growing up, did you have an invisible friend? Come, come on, come on. Did you have an invisible friend? Yeah, some of y'all are not wanting to answer. No one else could see them. No one else, you, you didn't see them, but you knew they were there, and you talked to them, you played with them, and you pretended this and that, and they were your invisible friend. And some actually started believing it because they'd tell others, see, Mom, I got my invisible friend here. And that leads to some psychosis later on in life if that continues, by the way. <laughs> probably, you know, you probably need to see a trained professional if you're still seeing your invisible friend today. But don't we treat God like an invisible friend sometimes? He's not that. He is not some make-believe invisible friend that we that we can put aside and, and then when we want to have, we're lonely or when we're in discomfort or when we need a friend, we say, come here and we start pretending again. He's not an invisible friend. He is real. So if he's real, but we can't see, how can we know him? How can we know he's, he's God, that he's real? God is known only by love and only by the, His Spirit that dwells within us. We know He's real by what He's done for us and the love that He showed for us. A love that no one else could possibly ever give us. If we love one another, God abides in us. Now see how that transition went? It went from invisible friend to you got to love one another. If you love one another, God remains and lives in us. Now this is the greatest evidence of God's presence and work among us. It's the greatest evidence. If you want to know God's real, if you want to know God is with you, if you want to know God is working in a place, it's by love. Since no one has seen God at any time, this provides the evidence for God and for the presence of God. You say, Brother Randy, I 
I've seen the power of God move through a congregation, through a service. I've seen the power of God. Okay? Is that power evidence of God? Let me tell you something. Jesus did some powerful things. Was a very powerful person. There was power at, at times. But Jesus went to sleep. Was there power in his sleep? Could you tell Jesus had that kind of that God was real because of the power of his sleep? No. But every time, the thing about Jesus was every time he did power, it was with love. Even though there's times that there wasn't power evidence. But he was always full of love. So you can't really go by power because besides that, we also know there's another power in this world and we can actually get very confused if we just go by power. He said, but Brother Randy, you just don't know the amount of people that are coming and here. I mean, God must be working because there's so many people that are here. So is, is that evidence of because he's popular? Oh my goodness, all day yesterday, there were literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who gathered in these little stadiums. And they were, well, that was popular. Or maybe some of the most popular shows on television. Let's just say right now the World Series is going on. And people are watching it. It's very popular. But is that evidence of God's power? I mean, God's popularity? No, I don't think so. And just because you've got someone who is filling up seats and they're very popular in their in, in, in God's work does not mean that God exists and that's the evidence that God exists and is working in, that, in those people. But I can tell you because, you know, Jesus was not always popular. He, at one time, he had a whole bunch of folks following. He was popular. But then at the end, guess what? He wasn't so popular, was he? They nailed him on a cross. They beat him. They killed him. Is that evidence of, of <coughs> excuse me, is that evidence of God's presence and work? Well, you couldn't tell it because of, of, the, of, his, of his popularity. What about passionate feelings? Passionate feelings. So a lot of that going on today. Sometimes Jesus didn't inspire passion in anybody. Matter of fact, some of them turned their back on him. There were times when there were, he was very passionate. There were people who cried and bowed down to him, Lord, save me. And then there were other times there was not. Was that the evidence of God's presence and power? And working? Not necessarily. We have a whole lot of folks today that says that's the evidence of God working. No. It just means somebody's crying. I don't know why they're crying. It just means somebody's all excited about something. Let me tell you something. It didn't happen last week but <laughs> or yesterday. But when I get into a football game, I can tell you that I get passionate about it. But that has nothing to do with God's power and presence. But I will tell you this. And when God is when God is powerful and is exhibiting power, and when he's not, it's always done in love. When he is popular, whether he was popular or not, he was always loving. And whether or not he had passionate feelings for or people for him, it didn't matter. He was loving. He was always full of love. Love is the constant. It's the greatest evidence of the presence and the work of God in Jesus Christ. Love is the evidence. Not whether how many people you have in your, your congregation. Not that matter how powerful a service was. Not it doesn't matter how you don't know for a fact that that's evidence of God's working. 
But I can assure you, if you see the love of God working throughout a group of people, saved, baptized believers in a church, you will know that God is alive and well within them. And they are exhibiting the proof that God is real. That's right. Amen. Love is the constant, greatest evidence in the presence and work of God in Jesus Christ. It is the, His fingerprint, if you will, even though we can't see, is love. And it says His love had been perfected in us, complete and mature. If we love one another, the love of God is complete and mature in us. The mature Christian will be marked by love. And again, the true measure of maturity is not the image of power, it's not popularity, and it's not passionate feelings, but it is the abiding presence of God's love in our lives, given out to us. God loves us, it goes through us, and we share it with each other. And that tells us that this is not any ordinary organization. It tells us that this is not any ordinary service. It's when we begin to love, love one another. Will there be power? Yeah. At some point, will there be passion? Yes. You can't help that to happen. Will there be popularity? I would hope so. But probably not. But, this is the assurance of the love of God's, this is the assurance of God's presence and His power is through loving one another. How can you be sure? How can you be assured of His love? We find that in the next couple of verses. By this, we have come to know and continue to come to know that we are residing in Him and Himself in us because out of His Spirit He has given and continues to give to us. And we have seen and continue to see and we are testifying that the Father has sent and continues to send the Son, Savior of the world. There's so much stuff in here. <laughs> By this, we are able, we know that we abide in Him. Now what does abide mean? To reside in Him. That we're living in Him. And we can know by experience that we live in God. If His love has been perfected in us, and we know that His love has been perfected in us, if we love one another. The sign of a, a mature Christian is that He loves the fellow Christians. That's the sign. We can know we are in fellowship and that He dwells in us. As saved children of God, sometimes in life we get away from God. But He still lives in us. We decide to go live someplace else for a while. Away from home. Do you know that you have eternal life? Do you know where you're staying right now? You need to know. Let me ask you a question. Right, let me tell you this first. Do you realize that there are people in this world today who will tell you that you cannot know that you're going to heaven until you get there or not? That's silly. <laughs> Can you imagine getting not knowing? John is telling us you can know. There are signs. And we, we spent the whole entire book showing the signs to tell you that not only can you, you know you're saved, but that you're in His will. That you're living in Him. He has given. We abide in Him. We live in Him. And He lives in us. And Jesus said in John 15 and 4 and John 15 and 7. He says... John, okay, there it is. Abide in me, and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear the fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. One of the ways Jesus abides in us, that he lives in us, lives in us is through his word. He shows us how we can be in fellowship with him. He shows us if there is any way possible that we could love not that we could not be loving our brother and be in fellowship with him. And the answer is we can't. More or less being saved. You see, he's given us his spirit. The moment you ask Jesus Christ into your heart and your life, the moment, the moment the time when Jesus is calling you on the inside, his spirit is convicting you of sin. And that's that moment when Jesus says, Come to me and believe, and you say, Lord, yes, I believe, that is when the Spirit comes in and He dwells within you, and then He seals you. <laughs> And you are saved. You're a one of God's children forever. That's simply the fact. God, and to this day, if you have, have asked Jesus Christ into your heart and your life, the Spirit of God dwells within you and will never, ever depart. It is the Spirit of God that is the abiding presence of Jesus. The presence of His Spirit is how He abides in us. It's the testimony of the Holy Spirit within us that makes it possible that we know that we abide in Him. We know that we're saved. We know that He'll tell us when we get far too far away from God, it'll tell us when we're not living with Him and in Him. And as Paul puts it in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness of our spirit that we are children of God. So I don't know anything about spirit. I don't know anything about whether or not God's come in and changed me. I don't, don't know if I've asked Jesus Christ in my heart and my life. I just know that right now there's something missing. If you're a saved child of God, you can know that you're saved. Because his spirit dwells within you. And he says, bear witness that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit gives us this assurance. And then he says, we have seen and testified. They knew, John knew, that the Father sent the Son as Savior of the world. Now, I'm going to say this, and, and, and I'm going to explain it. John can say that in a way that me and you can't say that. Dan, you can tell me that you know. And I believe you. I believe you know. But you can't say it the way John says it and means it. Why? Well, because he had a little bit of confirmation one time. Him and two others. John saw the glory with his eyes. They, were on the, they went to the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John, they were with Jesus, and he took them up, Jesus took them up there, <clears throat> and Jesus was transfigured, changed, bright, shining, glory. Peter, uh, Peter saw Moses and Elijah there too. Can you? I've always wondered this, you know, when they saw, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? Ever thought about that? Well, they had name tags on them, silly. <laughs> no. <laughs> you will be known as you're known. Do you think if, if, if we can recognize someone here, do you think we're going to be dumber in heaven? <laughs> I, I don't think that's an issue. But anyway, he saw Jesus transfigured, and he saw he saw Elijah and Moses, and they were just, you know, they were, Peter's going, he bowed down and he says, I'm going to build three shrines. Three shrines. One for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And it's this time the Father stepped in. Because you know why? It, now, if I'd been compared to Elijah and Moses, I'd been, I'd been proud. But this is a demotion for Jesus. And so God spoke to them. And look what he said. This 
is my beloved. Listen to him. Talking about Jesus. So John witnessed that. He knew more than any one of us could ever know that God the Father said, this is my son, you listen to him. He knew that God had sent his son through the words of God himself. So they have seen and they testify. The father sent the son. He's not mean. He's not some vicious, vile person. Uh, God who, was, who extolled justice on everybody. And Jesus was that Jesus was that guy came into loving and tried to pacify the, the father. No, God loved us. Doesn't it say God's for God so loved the world? Let me tell you what. You're in the middle of the ocean. Or a lake or whatever. And you start to start trying, you start drowning. What do you need? I know what you need. You need uh, uh, you need your phone so that you could Google it or YouTube it so you could figure out how to swim. Right? Or maybe, maybe you need a world-class swimmer to come up alongside of you, and you need that, that person to say, Well, here's how you do it. If you'll put this arm out here and here. No! We don't need instructional videos. What we need is a Savior. We don't need lectures. We don't need instruction manuals. We need a Savior. Knowing and understanding Jesus is the foundation for abiding in Him. Whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. It isn't enough to know the fact about who Jesus is. We, there's a lot of folks who know that God, they believe God exists, they think God exists, they understand that even Jesus went to the cross of Calvary for our sins. There are some folks that can tell you more about the Bible than I can. And the problem is, they have never truly believed in God's Son. I can know who He is. But is he living within me? Is he, is, is, do we know? It says confess. The word confess, the idea behind that word is to be in agreement was. Uh, to be in agreement. We must agree with God about who Jesus is and we find out what God says about Jesus through the word of God. You may know something without being in agreement with, with it. Okay? You may, it may be totally wrong. And you may know something. I know that Wiccans believe in or Satan worshipers and believe in. I know that. I don't agree with them. <laughs> I know a lot of things. But I don't necessarily agree with it. I know that Jesus Christ is God's only begotten Son, that, Jesus, that God sent Him into this world to die for us, a perfect sacrifice for our sins. He took our place on the cross, paid the penalty of sin for us. I know this, and I know this, and I agree with it. I agree with it. Now, I can know that and not agree. I, I agree with it. John doesn't think it's enough <laughs> if a person has some kind of love in his life if he does not confess that Jesus is, a God, is the Son of God. It isn't a matter of deciding between love or truth. We have to have both. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you cannot possibly know the love of God. And you could not possibly know how that love and how to love another in the way that God loves us. In this last verse, verse 15, and verse 16, he says, And we have come to know and continue to come to know 
And we have believed and continue to believe the love which God is having in us. God is love. And he who is remaining in the love, in God he is remaining. And God is remaining in him. So how do we respond to who God is and how God loves us? Have you ever had somebody that just loved you and, you, and, you, and you, I don't want your love to get back and they just kept doing it no matter how mean you were to them. They just kept, kept on loving you. It's aggravating. And that's what a lot of sinners do today is that God throws His love on them and they don't know how to react. So how do you react when God loves you so much? Well, people respond to the love of God differently. Some respond with a sense of self-superiority. I'm so great, even God loves me. <laughs> You're going to change that attitude. Some respond with doubt. Can God love even me? And some respond with wickedness. Well, God loves me, so I can do whatever I want to do. We've got a lot of Christians who are doing that today. God loves me. Doesn't matter what I do, so I'm just going to do bad stuff. God wants us to respond by knowing, by experience, to come to know and believing the love that God has for us. He wants us to come to experience it. He wants us to know it. He wants us to show it. He wants us to know just how much He loves us. And right now, so many folks have just, because of these, how we respond to it, we're just catching a little glimpse of how much God loves us and what He can do for our lives. Do you know that He loves you? I mean, really. Do you know that He loves you? <laughs> if that's the case. Or if you have that. We should consider what it would take for God to stop loving you? What would it take for God to stop loving you? Hmm. <coughs> Sickness, death, trials. What, you know, what, what would it take? Is there anything that would keep God from loving you? Well, what would it take for you to stop believing that God loves you. You also love them. You keep asking why. How can God be so cruel? How can he be so mean? God can't love me because he's letting all these bad things happen to me. <clears throat> or God can't love me because I did this, this, and this in my life, and he can't possibly love someone who does that. Paul, the Apostle Paul, knew nothing could separate him from the love of God that was in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, verse 38. For I am persuaded, this is the Apostle Paul writing this, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The answer is an unabashed no. There is nothing that can, you can do that will keep God from loving you. Period. It's just a simple fact. And you can decide not to love God back and that's fine. He'll still love you. You can decide that you don't need God's love in your life and that's fine. He'll stop. He'll keep loving you. You can decide that there's no way in the world that He could love you because I am in the process of living my life this way doing all these terrible and bad things and He goes, care. I'm going to love you anyway. If your answer 
to those questions where anything else but nothing can separate me from God's love, then you truly don't believe that He loves you. Love is unconditional. God is love. Wow. Remember that love cannot be God, but God is love. God sent His Son to be the Savior of this world. And this is the way we know that God is love. Believers must love. They must dwell in love. That, must, that means they must live in love. Love one another with all their hearts. Loving one another is the way that we can tell that we're saved. It's the way that we can tell that we're right with God, that we're in fellowship with God, that we're not that our home may be in Him, but we're living someplace else. If we're not, if we're living someplace else, we're not showing the love to others like we should. The way we know that we dwell in God and God in us is by our love. And if we love one another, then we're demonstrating the nature of God, which is love. We're showing God by loving one another. And if we're not loving one another, what do you think we're showing then? We're demonstrating that we do not have the nature of God within us. So loving one another is a way of showing whether we have God in us or not. That test is one that we all have to take and we need to take. To know that we're with him, that we're in him and he is in us. He who resides in love resides in God <laughs> and God in him. <clears throat> the Christian who has this kind of relationship with God will be virtually immersed in God's love. It becomes his environment. It becomes where he dwells. It becomes where he lives. Man. It's a shame so many people think that lost their right of favor with God and have lost his love. Before the world began, he knew you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you and he loved you. And despite all the terrible things that you've done in your life, and all the things that you've done against him, maybe you spat in his face. Every time that he would come around trying to love on you and you just rejected him over and over again, he still loved you and still loves you. And that's the reason why if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart and your life, you've never believed in the agreement way, Lord, <laughs> and truly believe and put your trust and your hope in him when and the Spirit's calling and touching your heart, and you've never done that, then you need to do that today. I believe today that you too can experience the love of God by coming to know Him as Savior. And today, if you're here and you've never had that experience with Him, you can do that right now. You can ask Him to save you. Because right now, I believe the Spirit of God is dealing with hearts of men and women here in this place. Not because of any powerful message or powerful singing or popularity of anybody. Not, and it's not because of anything else. Except by the love of God that's dealing with your heart. You're a lost and dying sinner and He loves you so much and He wants you to come to Him today. That's what He wants. And that's how you can tell us from God. So this morning, if you're here and you've never asked Jesus Christ and you're your Savior, you need to do that. If He's calling you right now and there's a conviction of your heart by the Holy Spirit telling you to come to Him, you need to do it. Say and say, Brother well, Randy, I do know. Do we really know the love of God in our hearts and lives? Do we really believe that He loves us? I do. <laughs> And if we really believe it, it will show by us loving one another. That's the test. And if we're not loving one another, there's something wrong with our spiritual lives. And that's between you and God. And you can make that right today also.
So as we stand and we prepare for an invitation, I don't know your heart, don't know your life. I don't know spiritually where you're at, what God's wanting you to do. I do know one thing, and that one thing is God is wanting you to love Him. He is wanting to love on you, and He's wanting you to love on others. So this morning, would you come? And would you express the answer of the Holy Spirit in your, your heart, your life today? So as we sing, number 562. 562.